Good afternoon. Welcome to the Healthy Indoors Show. I'm Bob Krell, your host and founder and publisher of Healthy Indoors Magazine. We have, uh, you know, for the past couple of weeks, we've been teasing a new offering from Healthy Indoors. Um, you know, and now, uh, you know, later this summer, we'll be debuting a new worldwide uh, edition of Healthy Indoors Magazine. So to that end, this week's show uh, has an international flavor. Um, we're uh, our, this week's guest is going to join us live right now from New Delhi, India. Um, it's Barun Agarwal. He's the CEO of Breathe Easy Consultants, PVT Limited. Um, and uh, Joe Medosh is actually coming in here. He's so, showing up out of nowhere. Uh, but Barun uh, is a serial entrepreneur. In his current role, he founded Breathe Easy Consultants, the leading full-service indoor air quality solutions company in India. And he co-authored the book, How to Grow Fresh Air, published uh, by Joggernaut Books. And I'm to show this. By the way, this is a very good read, my friend. I, I found this very informative. It's a great book. Uh, Brun has also served on the Indoor Air Quality Assessment Working Group of the U.S. Green Building Council, and he is a founding member of the Indoor Air Quality Association's India chapter and uh, current uh, chapter director for India. He's also a member of ISHRE, uh, the India Society for Heating, Refrigeration, and uh, I always get that wrong. Uh, air conditioning engineers. Air conditioning yeah. engineers, yes, okay. And he's the founding member of the IAQ committee of ISHRE that developed the first international standard for indoor environmental quality that was published back in 2016. He's also the technical uh, group chair for indoor air quality, uh, TG under ISHRE. He is a climate reality leader trained by Vice President Al Gore, and he teaches a course on human wellness in the built environment at the School of Planning and Architecture in New Delhi as a visiting faculty. So welcome, Barun. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Bob. Super excited to be here and a very good afternoon to everyone. Excellent. Um, and for you, obviously, it's a good evening. Uh, Barun, <laughs> we're, we're, we're privileged to have you take time out of your evening. It's 10.30 p.m. there, correct? That's right. That's and so right. it's late for well, you. Happy, happy to be here. And in the co-pilot seat, Coming from another location, a man of mystery and uh, the uh, Hayward Score Healthy Building Scientist and our co-pilot for the show, Mr. Joe Medosh. Welcome, Joe. Uh, your audio is not on. You're muted, but I can do that. Uh, there we go. So sorry, I jumped from one show to another. So I'm so happy to be here and be with you, Bron. So it's, uh, you know, it, I'm excited to hear what's going on in your world. So thanks. So, um, so. Uh, thanks, uh, yeah, th th so, th so this will be interesting. Um, there's uh, Brun and I've had some conversations uh, leading up to the show, and there's there's just a it's it's a different perspective from where you're at, my friend. And and it's like we, I, I guess I'd like to start with asking you, uh, you know, your background story and how you got into the world of uh, IAQ and indoor environmental quality. So Bob, uh, uh, that, that's a actually an interesting story because. I have very little background being in the IAQ industry. I've been working for the last 20 plus years of my life, but I've been in IAQ only for about eight or nine years. I lived in the US, so if I very, very quickly, I've been a commodities broker, I've been in cutting edge technology, selling uh, the first MiG-21 flight simulator, simulator to the Indian Air Force. I've so done the first video on demand system for Time Warner Cable in Hawaii. And then I ran a recruiting company. And after that, I moved back to India. And believe it or not, the air quality over here was so terrible that it kept playing on my mind. And eventually, I started a company to deal with indoor air quality. So uh, it's been eight, eight years. But it, the story started a little bit before that. My father-in-law has been working on indoor air quality here in India for the last 30 years. He has a building in Delhi, which has been certified to be the healthiest building of India by the Central Pollution Control Board. It's like the EPA in the United States. Uh, the Central Pollution Control Board has certified that building to be one of the healthiest buildings. And he's been working on this for himself. And he's got 7,000 natural plants inside his building to grow fresh air. He was invited to do a TED talk back in 2009 in California. And I happened to be in California at the time, listened to his TED talk and I said, that's brilliant what you've done. Why aren't you doing it for others? And he says, why don't you come back and do it if you want to start this as a business? One thing led to another in my life. And in 2012, I decided that the air quality was terrible. I had moved back to India by the time. And I said, there's an 
opportunity to do something. And that's how I got into the air quality business. So I, I guess, uh, you know, the follow-up to that, Barun, would be um, you come from a marketing background, um, you know, and a lot of people entering the indoor environmental industry come from, you know, the more of the engineering background. And uh, yeah, so how has that given you maybe a different perspective and, you know, how, how you've approached this? You know, you may not be, you're looking at it from a different perspective than many people who enter this industry, clearly. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And actually, I, I think there was a huge advantage coming in from a marketing perspective because up to then it was predominantly an engineer's field, right? Even now, a lot of people who enter the space are purely engineers. Mm -hmm. I came in and I said, how do I make this popular? How do I let people understand that what they're breathing is actually carcinogenic, is harmful, and create mass awareness about this issue? So that marketing background actually gave a huge advantage and an edge to create that awareness that was much needed in a country like India. And at, at, you know, at some point, I'm sure we'll talk about it because the numbers in terms of the problem, the problem uh, set that we faced here in India with regards to the outdoor pollution and eventually the indoor pollution was so dramatic compared to anything that you see in the United States or the Western world that it, it was so in my face because I had lived in the US for 12 years and for most other people, it wasn't so obvious. So when I took a dust track or a particle plus counter and I went to people's homes with those counters and I showed them, look, this is what it is and this is what it should be and with a machine, it can get there. They were shocked initially. And they, I mean, they, they would, I, I got crazy comments in the beginning. I got people saying that, oh my God, I have, we've had to pay for water for a few years now, now because of this crazy guy, we're gonna have to pay for air as well. So it was tough at first, but it was a huge, huge, huge paradigm shift in terms of the understanding that people had to go through. I mean, I think one of the things, a lot of our viewers obviously are, uh, you know, centered in North America. Um, so they, I think they don't really have a true perspective on some of the challenges, indoor environmental challenges that you face there in India, just because usually the, um, the mindset of, uh, you know, uh, reducing indoor pollution here, let's say in the United States, in most cases is to dilute with more outside air, right? Bring in more fresh air. Um, but that's not necessarily, outside air is not necessarily fresh air in your case, right? That is correct. It's not. It's not. And, you know, to put things in perspective, uh, I was in Boston and I got an outdoor reading of six micrograms per cubic meter. I was in Atlanta and I got an outdoor reading of seven micrograms per cubic meter. In most country, cities in the U.S., the reading is anywhere between that two micrograms and 10 micrograms per cubic meter. And the EPA's standard for human health or uh, and the WHO standard was 12 micrograms and they're talking about bringing that threshold down to nine because a difference from 12 to nine actually makes a huge difference in the quality of life and number of life years. Uh, now let's put that in perspective. The readings in Delhi in the winter months hit 400 micrograms per cubic meter. That is it's wow. equivalent to smoking 10 to 20 cigarettes a day. Now, that's okay for smokers because that's what they want to do. But what about kids? What about people who don't want to smoke? You're forced to put in that amount of black carbon into your lungs when you, and you don't have an option and you don't even know about it because it's invisible. Most people in Delhi would think it's fog and they would think it's a great time of the year to be outdoors and breathing that 300, 400 micrograms all day long. It was normal until that awareness came in. It needed a marketer to come out there and help people understand that there's a problem, not just an engineer. So I'm assuming there's, so, a, there's a, oh, Joe, take it. Yeah, so the, so when I first reached out to you, it was right after the IAQ conference, IAQA conference, and um, you, you asked, I said, hey, what's going on in your world? And this is the picture that you sent me driving down the road, and um, that was pretty shocking, and I was like, wow. So you talk about the fog. It's not a fog. Um, some people may think that they're in L.A., but this is actually much worse than L.A. has ever been. So I thought I'd share with people what it is that you actually see out your window on a regular basis. So this is actually a pretty decent day, Joe. Uh, there are days when the visibility is down to less than 20 meters in front of your car because of the pollution. That's how bad it is. Oh I mean, gosh. there are wow. a couple of days in a year that we've had and uh, where you can actually see the smog inside your house. You can actually see it inside. I mean, the, everybody says air pollution is invisible, right? In I, my job, I always say I've made the invisible visible uh, with, with technology, with meters, with sensors, and making people see a number. 
but it's much worse in India from a pers perspective. You can actually sometimes, rarely, but you can see a pollution inside your house. That's how bad it gets. And we're just talking about one pollutant right now, PM 2.5. Uh, when you start looking at the numbers on other pollutants, we, I've measured hydrogen sulfide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, ozone, all of these parameters well above the safe standard, well, well above the safe standards prescribed by the by WHO, by the Central Pollution Control Board, by any uh, authority around the world. The numbers that we found here in India, and especially Delhi sometimes, are way above those because there are two seasons for crop burning. What we do is, you know, a lot of the crop after harvest, um, the stubble in the ground is very difficult to remove and so they just burn that stubble and India being a predominantly agricultural country uh, a, there's a large part of the country which is uh, growing that produce and the harvest season is typically fixed within that one week period in October when um, it's and it, it's it, it's serendipitous because the timing of that harvest is coinciding with the weather pattern changing from uh, the warmer weather to the cooler weather so as it gets cold, they immediately harvest the crop and that's when they burn the residue on the ground. And now it's gotten cold and you have the temperature inversion. And because of the temperature inversion, it just, the, the smoke gets blanketed within a certain layer and stays down. Mm -hmm. And the entire Indo-Gangetic belt, I mean, it starts from the country of Pakistan. I call it the air pollution shed of India from not just over Delhi. It starts in Pakistan and it finishes in Bangladesh. It's right across the entire Indian uh, from east to west or right across and we're engulfed in a, in a blanket of smoke which has got a high level of salts and NOx and other pollutants mm -hmm. as well not just PM 2.5. And that's happening after, after so that's at its worst post-harvest but the, but you also have particulate issues just on an ongoing basis right throughout the course of the year. Oh absolutely in the in the summertime in the monsoon time when it's raining over here the rainy season as it is in India, uh, the, the readings are still at about 30 to 80 micrograms per cubic meter. And people say, oh, it's a great wow. day. We've got little blue skies because we see some little hint of a light blue rather than just a gray, a dull gray all the time. And so people think it's a great day outside when you know normally anything about 35 is not considered safe at all. So that brings up the, you know, the next question. So obviously you saw a need you know, and probably your perspective coming, you know, from spending some time in the United States uh, and, and having, you know, just different outdoor air quality, typically, um, e even in even some urban areas, the outdoor air quality, while we perceive it to be bad, you know, is not even a fraction of what you're just, you know, what, what you're uh, describing here. Um, so the thought being is that you're trying to, you can't really fix the outdoor situation. So the idea is to make a safe haven indoors for people. Is that, that's kind of the... Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of companies who are trying to put technology to fix the outdoor air with air purifiers for outdoors and the government is buying them, but they can't do. You can't fix the outdoor problem with air purifiers. You've got to fix it at source. So we do a lot of advocacy uh, on, on, on the outdoor air pollution side. So we've, I'm, I'm a founder of another not-for-profit called Care for Air, uh, which works on uh, awareness, advocacy and change on outdoor air pollution. But the business focuses on indoor air because you can actually control that. You can't actually, you can't just fix outdoor air with band-aid, with, with small band-aids. So, you know, you uh, described yourself as, you know, the, the largest uh, uh, total source provider for IAQ indoor environmental quality stuff in India. So, so what, what are some of the things that uh, Breathe Easy uh, does? Uh, so uh, we... Yeah, so we, we, it, we have three distinct verticals. One is a testing and consulting vertical. So we have uh, top of the line, class A equipment, you know, all for VOCs, for particulates, for socks, all the gases. We do all the testing so we can go in and do testing for la large, small facilities. We've had, we've had scientists call us to their homes to do testing of a lot of parameters a lot of times. And of course, we do larger facilities. We've done facilities for some of the big Indian software companies to Amazon's warehouses in India. We've done testing for them. Uh, the second vertical is a 
central solutions or a projects division where we take on large projects for large facilities. So we've done uh, all the international schools in India. So the American school in Delhi and Mumbai, we've done the German school in Delhi and Mumbai. We're doing the, uh, the British school in Delhi. Now we're doing the American school in Dhaka. Um, so we're getting outside of India as well with projects. So uh, a lot of the schools, we're doing a lot of malls, the larger malls, which are saying that we can do something about air quality and they're interested to you know, attract the right kind of clientele by marketing that service saying that we have clean air come in when it's really bad outside. Uh, so a lot of large facilities, so that's a projects business. And the third part of that, is, uh, the third uh, division is the, uh, the portable solutions business where we are the exclusive partners of a Swiss brand, which you're very familiar with called IQ Air. So we uh, distribute IQ Air products, uh, the entire range, their commercial products, as well as their portable home products across India. Uh, so we do it for homes, for offices, for smaller offices, which don't have central air conditioning. We'll use the IQ Air product line and uh, get that to as many people as possible. So a lot of embassies, a lot of expats. You know, initially, the business eight years ago was restricted to expats uh, because they could feel the difference of the air quality when they would come into India. They'd say, we need to do something about this. And slowly it started coming down to HNIs and other individuals. And slowly that market has shifted. But uh, that's our, our market range is... Uh, Across these three divisions for a large part of India, and, and you're you're based in Delhi, but you also have a Mumbai office. Is that am I correct on that? Uh, or... That's right. We have an office in Mumbai. We have an office in Gurgaon, which is close to Delhi, and we have one more office in Chandigarh, which is uh, a, a couple of hours away from Delhi. So you co do you co you cover the entire country fairly well? Or... So we have yeah. So now we've got distributors in other critical markets in the country. And uh, we've got projects that we've done in Calcutta, we've done projects in Mumbai, we've done projects in Bangalore. Uh, our portable solution, the IQ Air, has shipped pretty much, I would say, to more than 50 cities in the country, at least, if not more. Uh, there are even small towns with, I mean, the smallest town in India probably has half a million people. Uh, so uh, even to those small towns, we've got air purifiers shipping uh, all over the place. So, yeah, we have a pretty... Uh, strong reach across the country with our uh, online marketing, with our word of mouth, with our social media presence. Uh, and a lot of this is word of mouth, right? When somebody likes a product, they've seen it, and if they've bought an air purifier, irrespective of which one you've bought, if you bought one, you'll probably tell five friends that, oh, I've got this and it's the best. So being early players in the space, being the first mover in indoor air quality, we've had a huge, a huge advantage where our products and our solutions, people have said, you know, just go to Breathe Easy, go to Barun, and he knows what he's talking about. And, and at the end of the day, being a marketer doesn't mean you can just say whatever you want. It has to be logical. It has to be grounded in science. And so I spent about six months before I started Breathe Easy and just studying. I went through more than what I would perhaps have studied in an engineering course in understanding the science of air quality, understanding the science of air conditioning, before I even started uh, the project's business and started on air quality. And you started the company in what year? Uh, January 1, 2013. Okay. Yeah. So you've been I, at it I, for, so, a while. Been at yeah, for a while. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I told you about the TED Talk, and that's when I got really interested. But that TED Talk was in 2009, and I wasn't interested in moving back to India at the time. Uh, what happened after that was I moved back to India in 2010, uh, October 2010, I was running another recruiting company in, in, in the US and in India. So I was traveling back and forth every 30 days. And I got tired of that after doing that for five years. And in 2012, I took sabbatical for a year. And during that sabbatical, I was up in the mountains of the Himalayas. Uh, and I was just up in the mountains for about four months in the year, just doing nothing, meditating, relaxing, just detoxing and de-stressing from the last five years of traveling between India and the U.S. every 30 days. And both my kids during that time we had moved to India with two small kids and both of them had developed a little bit of wheezing and they were looking like they were getting towards asthma. And that's when, you know, up in the mountains, I experienced one night when it rained really hard in the morning, I saw clear blue skies, just like what I used to see back in the U.S., and that's when that TED talk hit me back again. And I said, 
you know what, air quality in Delhi is terrible. I think there's an opportunity. I'm going to go back to Delhi and start something. And that's how the story really started with Breathe Easy. I came back and this was three months before January 1. Um, and I said, I want to do something on air quality to my father-in-law who had that building. Uh, and he said, sure, you have access to the best building. You have, we have all the equipment, you have all the technology, all the books that you could ever think about, have at it. And I just immersed myself in the books, in the technology, in learning and understanding every single bit that I could about indoor air quality. And three months later, I was confident enough to say, I'm going to start a business. And it, it, I, the, the first eight months, believe it or not, I had a, some total revenue of zero dollars. Oh, I can believe that. You know, I, we're all yeah, entrepreneurs right. here. <laughs> <laughs> eight months and zero revenue. And it was like people would, you would say things like, he's crazy. He's lost it there. He is sabbatical. He doesn't want to work. He's trying to sell us air, which is, he said, he's telling us this pollution. I can't see it. Uh, so eight months of really uh, people questioning me. And uh, today, I think it's uh, the right place, right time. It's one of it's the last few years have been a brilliant, brilliant journey and a ride, which I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, I, I, I've been doing multiple things in my life. And I was being, I was called an eclectic entrepreneur where I wanted to keep shifting and doing something different because I got bored of it. But air quality has been one business for the last eight years where I say, I know I'm making a difference in people's health and well-being. I know I'm making a difference to this planet and I'm doing good uh, in the world and I'm going to take this to my grave. For the first time, I feel that here's an opportunity. Here's a business where I'm giving back and I feel good about it where I don't want to do anything else anymore. Do you think that... I know one of the, um, oh, so, so, yeah, so I know you do a lot of commercial uh, properties, but what is the residential... Um, awareness for people that are trying to do things in their home uh, here. It's uh, one of the growing industries that's out here. People are getting basically a, a portable air filter or something similar. Um, so I was wondering, what is that like in India? So, uh, you know, like I was saying earlier, the markets started off with the expat community. So teachers in international schools and the expats who are running some of the larger international companies in India would buy air purifiers and other products for their homes. Slowly, it trickled down to the HNIs, the high net worth individuals in India, people who would travel regularly to Europe and the US for work. They would then, as they got to know about this through media, through social media, through technology, all the different platforms that we would advertise and especially word of mouth, they would then become our customers and say, let's do something for our homes. But the challenge in India is you know, that, that that market is a very, very thin slice of the entire market. As you can imagine, it's 1.6 billion people is a large number of people. And a lot of them fall in a very, they're, they're so price sensitive that a product like an IQ Air is well beyond their reach. And that's where the challenge comes in for a country like India. So I end up serving a very small niche of customers at the very top end of that pyramid. And there has been a huge influx of other players in the market like the Philips and the Honeywells and the Sharps of the world and the Panasonics of the world that have launched air purifiers every year, at least 20 to 30 new products or new models and even new brands show up uh, selling air purifiers. Dyson launched in India because they saw the opportunity for a country like India and they put in $500 million in marketing in India. So it's a huge opportunity at the mid and the lower end. But my job is to still convince people saying, don't go for a holiday for one year and spend that money on buying an IQ Air machine because it makes a huge difference to the quality of life that you will have. I so mean, that's see, where we are. Do you see, do you think the impact that you can make in, in, in India, for example, you know, due to the outdoor considerations are perhaps even a, a, a substantially greater impact on people's well-being than even than we do in the West, you know, in in, uh, in like the United States, for example, the outdoor air isn't that bad, you know. Uh, in many, in most cases, you know, not all cases, but in most cases, with the exception of wildfires and that sort of thing, I think Joe would agree. It's generally better to go outdoors than be indoors in this country, right? Absolutely. For the most I mean, part, right? You know, but that doesn't seem to be the you know. It seems like it's a paradigm shift for you. It's so it's important. That your indoor environment becomes paramount, does it not? Absolutely, right? The most traditional marketing on indoor air quality has said that your indoor air is 10 times worse than your outdoor air. 
in India, you got to be careful using that. I mean, people use the same Western marketing language in their Indian right. marketing. And I say, that's not necessarily true. Yeah. Uh, over here, yes, partic- uh, your VOCs and your CO2 may be higher indoors if you don't have fresh air coming in. Because, you know, in India, a lot of, it's very different. Uh, one of the main things that I want to tell everyone who's listening in is the way homes are set up in the United States and the way homes, most homes are set up in India are very different. In the United States, most homes have central air conditioning systems. You have one single air con system, which pretty much is ducted across the entire home. And you, it may or may not have some fresh air in uh, coming in into it. In India, we have individual split air conditioners for every room because we are very conscious of the energy or the availability of energy is not so high. We can't just cool the entire house when we're all in one room at night. So every room has an individual split air conditioner and you only turn on the air conditioner where you need it. And hence your energy bills are much lower compared to what would be in a typical house in the US. I, I got zoning done in my house when I was there because it was a basement ground and first floor house. And before I got zoning, the whole house would get cooled or heated uh, and there was no, and, even though there were two people staying in, in one bedroom at night. Uh, so the huge difference over there. Now in that one room in India, which has a split air conditioner, you can have anywhere from two to six people sleeping in that one room. And there's no fresh air coming in whatsoever. So your carbon dioxide levels that were measured in that room will go up to 2,500 to 3,500 parts per million in that one bedroom at night. Whereas outdoor CO2 levels are 400 parts per million. That was the kind of awareness that we had to build that guys, your CO2, now now outdoor particulate matter is 400 and indoor particulates are also 400 or 300 or 250. Now you're talking about 10 and bringing it down to zero because you're making a difference in people's lives. We are bringing it down from 250 in my bedroom, it is zero, zero micrograms per cubic meter. And my CO2 stays at 600 parts per million all night long with three, two or two people or sometimes a small kid comes in if, if there's three then. Uh, so you've got a huge difference in what is possible and what is the reality over here. Uh, I've actually had parents put in solutions and they would call me a week afterwards and say, my child's asthma has gone down or the use of the nebulizer has gone down. And they, uh, the kind of testimonials we've got, Bob, absolutely incredible because that's what has kept me going. That's what tells me I'm making a difference and doing the right thing. Well, it seems like with those kind of numbers that you're, you're talking, you really can see an immediate impact probably where, you know, for, for us, I, I've been a consultant for 34 years in the U S and yes, I, I, I also feel that I've made, you know, made improvements in areas and environments for people, but a lot of times it's not, it's not, it's more nuanced, you know, it's not, not nearly as dramatic an improvement that quickly. So that's amazing. Uh, so one of the things you, you presented, you know, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Finish. Yeah. yeah. So one of, the, one of the things that was exciting to see, and I've got a lot of questions and other people have asked about how can plants improve indoor air quality? And you have an entire floor at one of your buildings probably was the one that your, uh, 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 did, inspired you to, to move into this industry. So I was wondering if you could expand on and people were like, oh, it, it can't really do that much or it can't really change carbon dioxide, but you have found that it can. So it's not actually a matter of adding a few plants to your living room, but you actually, there's actually a way to do this on an industrial level that can improve indoor air quality. Can you ex- extrapolate on what this is and how it can work? Sure, sure, Joe. So uh, it, you're absolutely right. It's not as simple as putting a few natural plants in your living room or in your bedroom. Uh, by putting even two or three or four or even 10 plants is not going to get you to the levels of CO2 indoors that you want. Because uh, I did an experiment early on saying, let's see, because before I figured out how to get my down to 600 parts per million on CO2 in a bedroom, which is, does not have any fresh air. I bought in 14 plants inside my bedroom and it's not a very big bedroom. It's a pretty small bedroom. So there was no space to walk other than the bed. There were 14 plants and the CO2 levels went from about 2,400 parts per million to 2,200 parts per million that night. Mm. So with 14 plants, it came down by 200, but I wanted it down to below 600 to below 800. At least the Harvard study said that you want your CO2 levels to be below 800 parts per million. So that's, I struggled for that for about four years, but In our building, what we've done is we've got an entire floor, the rooftop of the building converted into a greenhouse. And there's 7,000 plants in that greenhouse. And they're put into a special planter, which actually pulls air through the root zone of the plant and pushes it out. 
so it's got a mechanical ventilation system through the root zone of the plant for every single plant, which allows the roots to be a little bit more active. So what that does for us is it makes each plant work a little bit harder than a normal soil potted plant. Essentially, one plant gives us the equivalent of three to five plants. So having 7,000 plants is equivalent to having 20 to 30,000 plants on the rooftop of that building. Now, what happens is the outdoor air that comes into the building gets first filtered through multiple layers of filtration in the building and then comes directly into the greenhouse. Now, the outdoor CO2 levels in that area is about 430 parts per million on average. Uh, when it comes into the greenhouse, the plants gobble up the carbon dioxide and they produce oxygen. And the CO2 levels in our greenhouse are 30 to 50 parts per million less than the ambient CO2 levels in that area. So the CO2 levels in my greenhouse would be about 380, 390 parts per million on any, at any given time. And that you can feel it. You walk into that greenhouse, you feel as if you've come into a jungle, right in the middle of the Amazon jungle is how you feel if you walk into that greenhouse. Uh, and that 380 parts per million air is pumped into the rest of the building. Now, uh, if you're familiar with the ASHRAE 62.1 standard, there are two ways of adding fresh air. One is the ventilation rate procedure, the VRP, and the other is the IAQ procedure. Most designers design buildings based on the ventilation rate procedure. It's five CFM per person plus 0 0.06 CFM per square feet of space. Um, and then that's how you design the amount of fresh air coming in from outside. In India, it's not fresh. It costs me money to clean that air when I bring it from outside and it's pretty hot out here. So it costs me a lot of money to cool that air down as well. So we said, if I can grow my fresh air with plants and reduce the amount of air, air I need to bring in from outside, I can save a huge amount of money on my energy bills. And that's what we did. And that was an experiment 30 years ago. And for 30 years, it's been running now very successfully. And so by putting the plants, we were able to reduce from the ventilation rate procedure, the amount of fresh air that was needed in that building, we were able to bring it down by 80%. The amount of fresh air was reduced by 80% because I could actually maintain all the IAQ parameters. I was monitoring my PM2.5, monitoring my CO2, monitoring my VOCs, doing occupant surveys and ensuring that they were happy and comfortable with the air quality. All of the parameters as per the standard matched. And hence, I was able to reduce my outdoor air because, and we created that uh, the logo saying we grow fresh air. So we grew fresh air inside the building. We reduced what had needed to come in from outside. We saved on cooling costs. We saved on filtration costs, and we gave everybody healthy, clean air. Certified not only by the Central Pollution Control Board, but we had a team from Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, uh, Dr. Uh, Joshua Apte and his father. Uh, Professor Apte came in from Lawrence Berkeley Labs at the time to measure the VOCs and the air quality in the building. And in their report, they actually wrote that uh, it's one of the better buildings they've tested anywhere in the world. Uh, so we were pretty happy with that result. And this is the LEED Platinum building, right? In uh, That's right. It's the first retrofit LEED Platinum building of India. Interesting. That's uh, in the energy savings have to, you know, aside from the indoor air quality, the energy savings have to be attractive because there's an immediate payback when you do that. You said you, you reduced your uh, cooling costs substantially. So that's, you know, from the standpoint of uh, somebody that's actually speculating in building buildings, if you can have a major energy savings right out of the box, it's probably an easier sell with that technology, is it not? Oh, absolutely. Because you got to think about it. Uh, air conditioning is more than 50% of the energy cost of a building. And if I can make a substantial savings on the air conditioning cost of my building because of fresh air inside, then or because I'm growing my own fresh air inside, then automatically I'm saving a huge amount of money. In fact, there's a company in the United States called Inverted Technologies. They're based out of Boston. And Inverted create, has created a product which actually pulls carbon dioxide from inside air and thereby reduces the outside air intake. They have all CO2 scrubbers. Uh, the same technology, we use natural plants and we have a much larger whole floor dedicated to that. They have a small compact device which works beautifully and it's a CO2 scrubber. Same principle, but a mechanical solution which has huge energy savings ramifications in large buildings and it does the same job. So product has been developed to take what we did with natural plants with a simpler, you know, with, with us, natural plants need to be taken care of. There's a lot of TLC that they need. Uh, with, a with a technology like what Inverit has, it's 
you once you've set it up, you've tweaked it, you've engineered it, you forget about it. You just change the cartridges when you need to. Uh, we've done a couple of the inverted systems here in India also for people who said, no, the plants are too difficult or too hard to maintain. Give us something simpler. We've done the inverted systems in India as well. So now you also, in, in conjunction with your natural uh, carbon dioxide scrubbing with, with the plant base, you're dealing with particulate too. So there's filtration and obviously you have to have monitoring technologies, right? To be able to validate the, what's happening in the building, correct? So how, how, how is, yeah. in, you know, in, in a summation, how, how do you give, give us an overview on how you achieve that? So uh, first of all, the plants don't necessarily help in re reducing the particulate matter. The plants primarily help in reducing carbon dioxide, and they also do a phenomenal job at reducing volatile organic compounds. I'll give you a really quick example. On my rooftop, we put artificial grass to make it look green. And that artificial grass was giving out huge amounts of VOCs when we put a brand new layer, uh, sheet of that. And we were really worried that if the VOCs are going to be so high, this greenhouse isn't going to work. But once we put all the natural plants in place, all the money plants, within two days of putting the money plants, all the VOCs disappeared on the meter. So we've got all the measuring equipment and the plants gobbled up the VOC. So they're really good at removing VOCs from the local area as well. So we've got a fairly sophisticated monitoring system in place. So now we've got 24 by seven online monitoring in the building with the uh, Kytera monitors like the Sense Edge and uh, the Square. And we have a dashboard which gives us alerts if anything goes wrong with any of the sensors in terms of a reading going up. Also, we have somebody, we have an IAQ specialist in that building constantly uh, who goes around with A-grade equipment monitoring the air quality on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're not just relying on a B-grade commercial grade monitor, but we're using A-grade monitors as well to ensure that the B-grade monitors are giving us the right quality of data that we need. So monitoring is absolutely key because you can't fix what you can't measure. And once we've been learned how to monitor, and we've been publishing the results of the air quality of our building online on our website for the last 30 years. So it's not something that we just keep inside and, and don't tell anyone. We publish those results on our website, uh, on the PBC, the Paharpur Business Center website every single day for the last 30 years. Um, and we've got, as soon as you enter, it, you can't hide from it because as soon as you enter the building, there are big television screens, which actually tell you what is the air quality in that building at that point in time. Which makes sense. You really would want to broadcast that, right? I guess if, you, if you're Absolutely. doing it. So, so I'd like to totally uh, switch direction a little bit here and uh, talk, just talk a little bit about the COVID-19 situation in India. Uh, again, many of our viewers and readers uh, you know, are, are from the North American uh, continent. So I, I, and while we've been heavily hit, it seems like you, you are at critical mass to a not very good potential situation there. So how are, you know, what's, what's happening on the ground there uh, from what you're seeing? So I think, uh, you know, there's, in terms of the future, it's really hard to predict because I don't think anybody really knows what's going to happen. But India as a country uh, went into lockdown very quickly and it stayed in lockdown for too long. Uh, economically, we're a country that can't afford to stay in lockdown for a very long period of time. Uh, but we did. We stayed under complete lockdown for about two months. And now we re the, the government realized that you just can't stay in that, in that condition from an economic perspective. And those two months should have been spent in planning for what was to come. But unfortunately, they did not. And now they're opening up like as if nothing happened. And we're back to living life as if it was absolutely normal. And the numbers are going sky high. Testing is obviously not as, the numbers for testing are not as high as we'd like them to be, though they are getting better. Uh, but given the amount of testing that's happening, the number of positive cases are going through the roof. We're doing, in the city of Delhi, we're doing about only five to 7,000 tests a day, and we're getting close to 2,500 uh, positive cases as the last one I heard. So nearly 30% of the number of tests are showing up positive. So that's a scary number in one yeah. for one city. And that, I think the number is much higher than what is being reported. Uh, but uh, it's, it's a situation that's only going to get worse. Uh, and people don't understand it. The, the concept of space uh, is uh, between people is non-existent in India. 
Uh, people are used to being very close to each other. The concept of hygiene is very poor in a country like India. So those issues, when if you if if they're you know I, I say we're a very uh, we're we're not a mature country when it comes to hygiene and practices such as that. And so when you open up a country uh, without having proper protocol in place, you are going to go through a really difficult time. We're going to hit a peak at some point in the future. And our medical system is not equipped to handle that whatsoever. Uh, we're going to have a crisis on our hands. Uh, it's already there. Every day in the papers, you hear about uh, people not being able to get hospital beds and even passing away because not of, because of these problems. So the problem is going to get much worse in the months to come. Uh, what people don't realize is that air quality can actually play a large role in not only medical facilities, but also homes and isolation centers. And if they actually do the right thing from an air quality perspective, they can bring the numbers down. Uh, not everybody understands that. They want, to, they want the quick, you know, right now there's a lot of people saying, oh, just put a UV light and it'll take care of all your coronavirus <laughs> wait yeah. you have you have that over there too we have that over here also they're like yeah, <laughs> yeah. uv is the solution you so know, yeah. i mean and it is it's you know it's a one of the tools that can be used as part of a solution certainly Absolutely. you know Absolutely. there's no silver bullet yeah, but that's, I, agree. I agree but, but, no, but it, it is very effective when used correctly and usually it's used in a hospital setting that is uvc not something as a residential application so you know let's, let's make sure we do our homework we're not here to, to bash uv uh, anything no, no, i mean no, uv yeah, technology yeah, is yeah. very effective against microbes i mean it, it's, when it's, it's when installed correctly yeah. But, yeah. exactly and it has its limitations like as as does every technology but i mean you know one of the so you know prior to the pandemic you know, we would see uh, photos from Beijing, you know, in China um, with, you know, it seemed very common that people had like the KN95 masks on and that sort of thing seemed not uncommon there. It w how about in, in India? Was that the case too when people were outdoors or not so much? Oh my gosh. So that's something that is a pet peeve for me. I spent eight years convincing people that, should, that they should wear some sort of mask of protection to help themselves when they're outdoors nobody it's just culturally unacceptable to wear a mask in india and it was an uphill task to get anybody to wear a mask uh, i i wear one of the craziest looking masks out there with a tube because i just don't like the recirculated air inside a mask and i don't like the heat build up and the moisture build up so i wear something which brings in again fresh air from the outside filters it with an h13 filter and pushes it through a tube into my mask and people see that and they look at me funny when I'm walking in the morning wearing that saying, oh my God, he must be sick wearing that. I look at everybody and say, you're going to get sick if you don't wear something like that. And it's right? like so a PAPR, culturally. right? It's a powered fan powered unit, basically. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, but it's, so, uh, yeah. In fact, when I reached, when I reached out to you, Brian, I'm like, what are you using? And you sent me that. I mean, that day I bought five for my family and uh, sent a bunch of friends there because it was right. very economical, you know, positive airflow. So it was, it was something simple that I felt that it also just uh, was easier on my lungs when I wore something like that. When I fly, uh, I have that with me all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I wouldn't fly again without the, that at all. Uh, so I wear that, but culturally, it's still really hard for people to wear a mask. However, COVID-19 has changed that completely. Everybody's wearing a mask. But it's still culturally unacceptable here, though. Let me let me tell you, there's a good portion of the United States that is ready to have a rebellion over having, you know, the inconvenience of wearing a mask on your face. But that's that's another oh, story. God. Really? Wow. Yeah. But it's it's, it's a, 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 a political. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's making cotton masks at home and wearing those, which is fine. You know, at least you're not spreading your particles onto others. Yes. Uh, which right. is the critical part. And that's okay. I think WHO has also come up with a guideline that says that that's acceptable. Uh, but again, it's the mindset which I think has changed. And hopefully it stays and people understand that it's an issue even during the winter months once COVID is gone, that wearing a mask is still useful for them. So I want to bring this topic back to industry, and that is that I'm sure you've been getting a lot of calls saying, how can I make my building healthier, safer from the COVID-19 exposure? So uh, let's hear what you have to uh, share with us about how um, a company, not, not a residential, but a company can do that because uh, buildings have much more financial abilities and have uh, different airflows. They have, they have opportunities to do this. So not always uh, the case for my house. So what do you got for us? So believe it or not, in the last 
few weeks, we've got a, a couple of large organizations, German organizations, Indian organizations that have reached out saying, we would like you to do some consulting for us and help us fix our buildings before we get our people back to work. So I was part of a committee uh, on of ISHRE, the Indian Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers, like the ASHRAE of the US. This is the Indian version of ASHRAE. It's, it works under the US ASHRAE. Uh, uh, and ISHRAE has a committee which came up with a guidelines document for COVID-19 related to HVAC systems. And I was lucky to be part of that committee. Uh, a group of eight of us, really smart folks, uh, the rest of them, uh, which uh, <laughs> that, that uh, put together a really smart document. And they asked me to put in a small part in that document, which was on filtration. And essentially that uh, whole document, I, I, I tell people it's five critical pillars related to the COVID-19 guidelines that we have. Uh, and the five pillars, uh, and again, I, I, like you said earlier, Bob, there's no silver bullet, right? None of, if you do everything right, there's still no 100% guarantee that your building will be 100% free from COVID-19. But if you do all five, you probably reduce the chances by a lot. So the five pillars that I talk about are A, ventilation, so fresh air, increase as, to, as much fresh air as you can at a time like this. Uh, B is draft, so the speed of air coming in, the direct draft that comes in and the return air, so how hard the air is blowing within that space because a draft can move the particles to, lo to longer distances. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got temperature, you've got humidity, and you've got filtration. So you've got to have and filtration. The key that we've got in there is certified H13 filters because the word HEPA is used very loosely in the industry, right? Uh, I don't know how it is in the States because I never was part of this industry in the United States, but in India, HEPA is used very, very loosely and people will go as far as even saying that, oh yeah, we are H13 or H14 equivalent with some weird standard that they've done from some other country, which has no resemblance to what a true HEPA filter looks like. So we very specifically gave the international standards of EN 1822 or ISO or uh, IS, the, the specific standards. And we said, if, if it's H13 or equivalent, then we know that it will give you 99 point, a minimum efficiency of 99.95% for particles down to 0 0.003 microns in size. And we know that the coronavirus is 0 0.06 to 0 0.13 microns in size on average. So uh, you're sure that you'll pretty much get the coronavirus particles in the filter for anything that is in the, that particular bit of air that goes through the filter. So the number of air changes, the right filtration, the right amount of dilution, because you know the fresh air, the dilution is the solution to pollution is what we've been using a lot. So if you can do the dilution, you can do the filtration, you've got the right temperature, you've got the right humidity, and you reduce the draft, so reduce the fan speed on your air conditioning system. These are the five pillars. You've done these five, there's a very good chance that you can actually reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19 within your facility. I mean, so this, this global pandemic, you know, is, is to some extent, right, with, with the lockdowns, and again, you, you're in your country's for the most part, out of lockdown, I'm assuming, right, at that point. Much of the United States is out of lockdown. Many countries are coming out of lockdown or, you know, varying degrees. But, you know, it, it's definitely, has, has it not been a watershed moment for the value of the indoor air quality, you know, in your indoor environment when people are spending more time indoors than maybe the typical amount of time? And, and a second part of that is how do, you, how do we capitalize on this global moment? Uh, you know, the fact that maybe people are more aware about their indoor environments, you know, this pandemic maybe has brought that front and center. And, and what do you think are some ways that we can help capitalize on promoting those healthy indoor spaces? Oh, I think you're absolutely right. This is a great opportunity to help people understand that, you know, air quality is not just COVID-19, but everything else today and in the future can have a huge impact on lives. You know, there's enough articles that talk about how PM 2.5 affects people, not only a human being, but even the fetus in the mother's womb gets impacted with PM 2.5. But COVID-19 has brought all those issues front and center. People are in their homes, they're worried. They're Right now they're worried to put on their air conditioner because they read some article that an air conditioner in a Chinese restaurant made three other people sitting next door uh, to uh, get coronavirus. So uh, people are scared of turning it on. People are scared, don't know what temperature to put it on. So the air quality community, I think, has a great opportunity to lead this an effort and come out in the front and say, we know the science. We know 
what it takes because COVID-19 can travel on particulate matter. So bringing down the particulate matter with the right filtration will reduce the ability for COVID-19 because it's not an airborne virus by itself otherwise. So that level of awareness needs to be created to say that the IAQ community is a scientific community that knows what they're talking about and people can actually do something and make a difference to their living spaces and their workspaces. Like Joe said, uh, the building community is, it's easier for them. They have the money, they have the muscle, they have systems in place which they can tweak. And they're looking at technologies today and saying, what can I do before I bring my people back to work? And it's our responsibility to ensure that we do the right thing and give them the right advice so that when they come back, they're as safe as possible. And if they see that they're getting the right advice and they're doing the right things and they get a benefit out of it, I think that will automatically spread with word of mouth. Yeah, so so I clearly come from the perspective of uh, the survey or information uh, from Hayward Score. So you've done a lot of amazing um, indoor air quality improvements in the buildings you've been doing over there and the ones you probably hit down here or advise people. Have you been able to document any um, health reduction or health savings um, for some of these companies or their buildings? Is that something that is not actually addressed or you've actually found that there is actually something that's a bonus out of this? That's you know, not just so I say, I, oh, I feel so much better. Thank you. But it actually shows that they're not going to the doctor as frequently from uh, previous. That's a great question, Joe. Uh, you know, what we did at our own building, so we haven't done this for too many clients, but scientifically we've actually proven and we've done this in our building. What we did was we measured the blood oxygen saturation levels, the SpO2 levels for every occupant coming into the building in the morning and leaving in the evening. And we measured their pulse rates. And what we found was that when they came in in the morning, there was a 42% probability that their SpO2 levels would go up by 1% if they were in our building, which had the natural plants with perfect CO2 and perfect PM2.5 versus a, 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 a 39% probability of it coming down by 1% versus in the contrast buildings, which did not have the same air quality, the probability of it going down by 1% was much higher and if, uh, of it going up by 1% was only 11 or 12%. So, now there's a, if you look at your blood oxygen saturation levels, most people say 1%, what's the big deal out of 100? But your range for SpO2 for a human being is between 95% and 100%. So you have a five, 6% range. Within that site, 6% range, if your SpO2 levels can go up by 1% in, from morning to evening, and most people get tired and typically comes down, there's a 2% swing. That's a huge swing because of the air quality. And we've directly attributed that because, because all other buildings that we took had most other parameters similar. It was just the air quality difference which ensured that your SpO2 levels would go up by one or 2%. Now you can Google uh, the impact of SpO2 levels on human brain product on productivity and, uh, uh, and brain function. And there's a clear, uh, and there's clear studies, even Harvard has done studies right. which says that uh, with lower CO2 levels, your brain productivity and your uh, functions go up. So clearly we've been able to demonstrate that the SpO2 levels going up medically has made people healthier and better. And pulse rates for us in our buildings also came down by about four to five part, uh, beats per minute over a long period of time with an, on an average. So uh, they're, they're clearly health benefits. And that's what I talk about and I teach uh, during my wellness uh, course at the School of Planning and Architecture is about human wellness. I, I, I propagate this, I say if Bhutan is a country can talk about gross national happiness, why can't we have an indicator for every building as to how happy and how productive people are in every building? And if people are happy and productive, then they'll all, always be healthy and well. And so that's what our goal has been to create well buildings across the country over here. And that's hard to well, you want to know how, yeah, yeah if you want to know how important that oxygen is, ask Lance Armstrong. That's what he was focused on was how much blood, how much oxygen did he have in his blood? So that's what he was doing is transfusion to get more oxygen in his blood. That's what boosts his you know, production. So that it is something that isn't just brain function. It's an entire, you know, healthier outcome when you have more oxygen in your blood. Sorry. And maybe some of his other chemical enhancements, but that's another story. But uh, um, certainly the, uh, you know, the study you refer to, the Harvard study um, that was in, in uh, collaboration with Syracuse University and actually was conducted here in Syracuse at the uh, Center of Excellence. They have a, a very high tech research lab. It's also a lead platinum building. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, it was it's some it really, I, I think some very important data that maybe even though it's gotten a lot of press, 
I don't know if it, if it's actually had that much of an effect down at you know building owner level, right? And you know, we we in the IAQ community, you know, tout this and and, and flail it all around. But you know how um you know how do we take how do we take this and, and in your market? I'm taking this to you now, Baran. How how in your market in India do you take information like this and make it something that somebody will you know take action on? Oh, yeah. How is how has your market changed? Because now you've been doing this you know, over eight years. Um, how how is how has your market changed from the time you started? And, and have you seen some change in your in what your customer profile looks like and just how how you appeal to them? You're a marketing guy, obviously. This got to be. I don't want you to give away your yeah. trade secrets, but you know, in general, no, no, no trade secrets. I think one of the things that has worked really beautifully is right at the reception of large buildings, of offices, we put up some really interesting signage. We put up television monitors, which tells you what is the comparison of outdoor air versus indoor air inside my office. And the contrast is so stark here, right? But I was telling you, when you see that the outside is 400 and it's deemed to be hazardous by the US uh, uh, standards and indoor is, so it's purple, hazardous is purple, uh, on that on that uh, on that color chart, and indoor it's green, it's good, and the availability of sensors has become super easy. You can get a sensor here for a hundred dollars to measure PM two point five, and so people get that and they see, oh my god, in my house it's purple, it's three hundred, it's hazardous. What do I need to do in order to fix it for my space? So when they see a beautiful screen which says this office has clean air. The next call goes comes to us saying, I just saw the screen at my friend's office or at my vendor's office or at my client's office. How do I get this in my office? That has been our biggest marketing tool, a, a good looking screen with good graphics. And we, we keep changing that screen every five or six seconds with more information. So somebody sitting at the reception, if they spent a minute, they they're just, their eyes are glued to that screen. And that's what they're looking. And that's when they come back with ideas and say, how do I do this for my facility? That's been our biggest marketing tool. Other than, of course, the word of mouth of that owner telling everybody saying, I've done this for my office. Why don't you do it? I think it's a great idea. Now that, that seems that seems like a dramatic way to illustrate that in real time. And you know, somebody sitting there is going to take notice of it. Um, so great. And that contrast helps you, right? It, it, I think that outdoor air... The, the problem statement helps you because the contrast is so stark right. that it, it can't be missed. You, you, ha you have a serious, seriously dramatic difference indoors to outdoors at a starting exactly. point already, or <laughs> generally speaking. So, you, you know, we've, we've talked about Ishray a little bit in the, the discussion today. Um, and, you know, it being, is that the preeminent active organization for indoor environmental quality, would, would you say, in your country or? At this point? Yeah, I would say in India, I would say Ishre is perhaps the largest community of engineers working to work on indoor environmental quality. Up till now, it was mostly predominant on, um, uh, on air conditioning. However, uh, in the last couple of years, in 2017-18, a new standard was created by Ishre called the IEQ standard. So indoor environmental quality was uh, the first standard was created. I was, again, lucky to be part of the team that created that standard. The second version of that standard was published, uh, I think, early, late last year in 2019. Uh, so we are in version two of that standard. And uh, so air conditioning was the primary, primary focus. And slowly they're realizing that the air conditioning market has fragmented tremendously. It's the margins are really low and they're looking for other opportunities. And the awareness on IEQ is growing, right? It's not just indoor air quality, but it's also now the sound levels. It's also thermal comfort. It's also the lighting levels with circadian lighting and all of those other things. So we're talking about the entire spectrum of that well standard and the IEQ standard covers a whole bunch of those things. So people are looking at that and Ishray has been at the forefront of doing a lot of that. So I was talking, uh, one of the things that uh, last year, Ishray, just like uh, AHR in the US is the biggest trade show for uh, industry. In India, we have the ACREX, which is the Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Expo. Uh, and the a ACREX is one of the largest shows in the Asian region for HVAC uh, industry. And last year, the theme for ACREX was Shud Vayu Dirg Ayu. Now that's a Hindi terminology and I'll translate it. Shud Vayu means clean air and Dirg Ayu means long life. So the theme of the entire event was clean air, long life. So there's a huge 
thrust and a focus and attention going into air quality and clean air. And again, they gave me the responsibility to create a live demo, a demonstration of clean air. So we set up five rooms showing different technologies with air quality monitoring in each of the five rooms and showing how different technologies would change the results of air quality for PM levels, for TVOCs and for carbon dioxide, depending on what technology you would use or not use. So we set up, a, and it was a very popular exhibit because everybody would walk through the front with a glass panel and see the numbers for each room, depending on the technology that was deployed inside. So it was a live exhibit on clean air and how to achieve wow. those results. That's so fascinating. It made, again, it made, something that is abstract, right? Pollution is very abstract mm -hmm. in people's minds. My job with that exhibit was to make it real and center. So people could walk through it and see it for real in terms of a number, in terms of the technology that was visible with the right signage. And it became, it, 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 it became really popular because of that. Now you mentioned you worked on the COVID-19 document for Mishra. You were That's on that right. committee as well. Uh, tell us yeah. a little bit more about that. And maybe just like uh, just an, a, a, an overview of, you know, what, is it a prescriptive document um, or is it more of just an over, over uh, generalization? It's a, it's a guidance document for HVAC systems. Uh, again, like I've mentioned the five pillars that it is based on, uh, but we did it really quickly. I mean, uh, we've had multiple calls over a period of one week and literally uh, multiple calls every day over a period of one week. And we published that entire document, which wasn't easy to do. And as soon as it was published, uh, you know, the Indian Medical Association, IMA, which is again, a fairly large uh, organization here in India, uh, in the medical fraternity picked up the document. And that document has been picked up by not just uh, the industry that Ishre serves, but it got also got picked up by the government agencies around India. So it got huge traction with the Public Building Works uh, organization to all the government agencies start picked up that document and started referring that document in all their guidance uh, literature to all their building, uh, building owners or building uh, occupants. And so the IMA called us very shortly after we published that document, the Indian Medical Association and said, we would like to write a document which is targeted specifically for healthcare organizations. So for hospitals, for operation theaters, for OPD facilities, for dental offices, we wanna target a document which is specifically for the healthcare facilities. So again, we went back to the drawing board and we created another document, which we then submitted to IMA and only earlier this week, it was published under the auspices of IMA and ISHRAE, um, which again is targeted towards the healthcare community, which I think is one of the most critical things at, at a point at a time like this and uh, where we are right now, where uh, healthcare workers are front and center of the problem and they're most at risk. Uh, I, and there, I've been to a hospital uh, in the last, during the last few weeks, I've been to a couple of hospitals and you know, I go in with my shield and my mask and my easy flow pressurized mask. I do all of that to protect myself. But I go into these hospitals and I see some of the conditions in these hospitals and they're terrible. They're not designed right. They're really old hospitals. They don't even have fresh air systems built into the, their air conditioning systems. So they're running on 100% recirculation air, which is a nightmare. I mean, yeah. this, that's how so many of the healthcare workers are falling sick in India and getting COVID-19 themselves. Uh, so we're trying to give them the right advice to do the right things and not just put a UV on the ceiling in, in, in the OPD. That's just not going to cut it. They need to do more. They got to follow the guideline document a little bit better. And I think they're starting to realize that, yes, there is some benefit in it. There's, you know, the, the right people have put together a document. Let's try and do as much. So more and more people are starting to call us, you know, the, especially the committee who's created that. Uh, I, I got calls from people across the country saying, I, is that you? Was, is that the Barun Agarwal I saw in the document? Is that you? I said, yeah, it was me. So, you know, a lot of people who know me and they know that I'm not an engineer, they wonder how the hell did I get my name on a document like that? But then they don't realize <laughs> that I spent six months studying the topic more than I would have studying in engineering school or engineering college. Um, so uh, 
we're able to put in some good information in there, some practical advice in there that if you have a split air conditioner, what should you do? If you have a central HVAC system, what can you do? Uh, what are the benefits of putting a UV? How should you put the UV light? If, what Should you use ionizers? That's another thing that is being really hot right now from a marketing perspective, people saying just put a negative ionizer or, or an ozonizer and it'll fix your problem and completely take it away. People are selling UV towers, which are robotic UV towers. You yeah. put it in a dental room and turn it on uh, after you leave the room and it'll go off after a few hours and, uh, or, and they say it'll clear everything up, but it won't. In the shadows, it's not going. Right, it'll clear what it hits. It'll clear what it hits. That, that, that's what, you know, again, everything, people have to realize limitations of all technologies. You know, there's exactly. just, yeah, it's a part of, you know, it could, it's a tool that could help, you know, be, be you know, it could be beneficial, but it's not going to be a single source. There's not a single fix for any of this. Unfortunately, we that's have it. to, we haven't really engineered our indoor environments worldwide as such, you know, and, and I think this pandemic's exposing a lot of our uh, weak undersides of everything. Absolutely. So it is the it's that time of the hour where I'm the one who says, okay, why don't you give us your so I'm going to ask you your, your final question in your summary. Instead of just saying what's going on in India or the U.S., uh, why don't you just give us uh, one thing that you, you think of it, it's a global challenge because I'm sure they're having similar issues in China or uh, you know in South America. What's your one global comment as to what we should be doing to make our um, indoor breathing air uh, better? You know, I tell people that if I can fix the air quality in my room in the world's most polluted city and get it to Swiss quality air, and even better, I would say my PM 2.5 is zero. My VOCs are zero. My CO2 is perfect. Anybody can do it. It's possible. It's doable. And the way to do it is very simple. Just a little pressurization with the right filtration. That's it. If you can get a little bit fresh air from outside, filter it at source and bring in a little bit pr positive pressure because of that and the right kind of filters, you can get perfect air quality anywhere in the world. It's possible. If I can do it, anybody can do it. As simple as that. That was brilliant. And that would, that would, was, I would describe that as an amazing recipe. Like it just takes two or three ingredients and to make the most amazing meal, you described the most amazing building uh, on the simplest terms that is achievable by uh, any any architect or any designer. So well done. Thank you. So, you know, obviously um, this, we only just brushed the surface uh, on the discussions that we can and will be having moving forward. Um, there's, you know, as, a, as an additional tease to what's going coming up uh, in the next several weeks with Healthy Indoors, uh, Bar uh, Barun is, is definitely in, involved with um, some of the initiative that we're doing in India uh, as part of our uh, uh, worldwide outreach for the new uh, online publication. Uh, and again, we're not getting rid of Healthy Indoors magazine. We're adding a, a quarterly online digital augment that will have more of an international flavor and uh, not just be so North American centric because that's what we've been for the most part. Um, so that, that that's exciting stuff coming up. I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, working with you on those initiatives. Um, let's talk a little bit just uh, just about your website. I'm going to uh, put that up there if we hit the right button here, so the audience will see this. Um, that's uh, so your your website is breatheeasylabs.com, right? That's how they can that's how they can find you breatheeasylabs.com. So uh, the online audience is seeing that right now. Um, so definitely. Uh, would you know suggest that you take the opportunity to uh, head there, take a look at what uh, what he what he and his company are doing in India because it seems quite innovative and uh, pretty exciting. Um, also, you know I can't can't go without uh, mentioning Joe Madash's initiatives uh, with Hayward Score. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. You're actually in in another. You're not in a normal place. Are you in having a vacation? No, yeah. Yeah, no, I wish. Uh, I'm actually in California. Um, we're trying to help uh, 
people who have hotels get back to normal. Um, and uh, so we're also trying to figure out a certification method to help people with uh, unique hotels uh, understand their ventilation uh, challenges. So that's where I'm at today. But I get to stay in some of these nice places to evaluate uh, what's actually happening. So that, that was a great experience. So uh, uh, briefly, so Hayward Score is a uh, free online tool that helps you determine if your home is impacting your health or how to just make your home healthier in a uh, place where you really want to spend more time and it just kind of becomes a your shelter in place is somewhere where you want to make sure it's fantastic as uh, Brown described is you know it can be have an amazing fresh air and low VOCs in those conditions so uh, HaywardScore.com is where you can get that so thanks and of course um, you, you're watching the Healthy Indoors show well actually you might not be watching it on HealthyIndoors.com and, and in all likelihood you could be watching it on one of our many uh, Facebook pages around the planet um, or on YouTube or who knows where, wherever else you might be finding us or the podcast however um, we our home base and our mothership is HealthyIndoors.com and that is the uh, that is the central location repository for all of our content uh, all the back issues of our flagship uh, Healthy Indoors uh, magazine which is uh, again not just North American because it's available free worldwide and it's a digital monthly publication. Um, also the Healthy Indoor Show, um, which you're watching right now. Um, all of our back episodes are available there and you can watch it currently there. And the Healthy Indoors podcast, if you can't bear to look at Joe's and my face on a regular basis, it's a, a great way that you can listen to our golden voices but not have to be subjected to the visual image of us on the screen, uh, which is not a bad thing either. So it's a great opportunity. It's on the go. It, it, yeah, it, it's, it's the show on You the can go. take us with you. You know, in fact, you could have your you could have your phone with your earbuds and your, uh, you know, respirator and, uh, you know, fly worldwide with it. <laughs> uh, on, on that note, uh, on that point, um, I guess I guess it's time, you know, again, to bid adieu. Um, and, you know, I, Baron, I really I really appreciate the fact that you took the time, you know, to be here. It's like uh, heading towards midnight right now in uh, Delhi. So that's wow. Thank you. Thank you for doing that for us. It's just the afternoon for Joe. It's morning. I don't, you know, and, and you, you look <laughs> yeah, very relaxed, Joe. So whatever, it seems like <laughs> your job suits you well. Um, so with that, I, I'm going to sign off for the day and for this week. Now we have, uh, we have an interesting show coming up next week and I really have to, I have to mention that. So bear with me here for a second. I want to make sure we bring this up. Okay. Well, so about, next, Ron, thanks for everything you're doing. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank uh, you so thank very, you very much. much. And we're thank again, we're really, happy. Sorry, thank you for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. We uh, we really I, I thought you brought a wealth of knowledge and just a, just an energetic attitude that's just fantastic. And again, looking forward to hearing a lot more from you moving forward. Um, you also have a, uh, a, a a YouTube video show that you do. How often do you do that? Is that a yeah? That's actually a one episode. It's short, three to five minute videos that come out every few every couple of weeks. It's uh, on air with Barun. Uh, so uh, it's on YouTube and uh, we're, uh, I'll, I'll send you a few links of those and you can share them around. If you're Perfect. Awesome. We'll, we'll actually include that um, in the show notes uh, up on our site and on the podcast for that. And uh, we're also planning on that. That'll be uh, one of the items that we'll be featuring on the new digital edition on Healthy Indoors Global, again, which will debut in several weeks. So that's, you know, I'm going to keep teasing that as we get closer and closer. It's very exciting. But for another tease, let's 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 go for a tease for next week's show, because on the 25th, we have a really interesting show. Uh, we're going to be discussing sustainability, racial justice and healthy environments with Suzanne Shelton, president and CEO of the Shelton Group, a sustainability marketing and branding company in Knoxville, Tennessee, and Dr. Lilia Ebron. Uh, she's the president and CEO. CEO of Peer Consultants, uh, which is a 41-year-old environmental engineering and consulting firm in Washington, D.C. This is going to be a real good show next week. So not to say this one wasn't. This show was a great show. Uh, this is our first international show. Uh, but we will be uh, back um, next Thursday, 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, U.S. Time. Um, and also available on HealthyIndoors.com. The recordings will be there uh, shortly today, and the podcast will be up available later uh, today or for tomorrow for you, Ron. <laughs> yeah, it'll be available. So um, with that, thank you so very much for joining us this week, and we look forward to seeing you on uh, future episodes of the Healthy Indoors Show. So for Healthy Indoors Magazine and the Healthy Indoors Show, I'm Bob Krell, and stay safe, stay healthy, and by all means, be conscious of your indoor environments. We'll see you soon.